So we got a question that was wanting further explanation about the origins of the Anglican communion. These mountains behind me are uh, from West Virginia and, I, and I've got them behind me because you know Anglicanism did not start in West Virginia. It is the history of the church, Christ's one holy Catholic and apostolic church as the church has come from what we call England, those, those islands, the Anglo-Saxon tribes, but it goes further back than the Anglo-Saxon tribes to probably the first century. There were 10 trading routes between tin mines in Southern Britain and, um, and Egypt and Alexandria, parts of Palestine. And early Christian tradition tells us that Joseph of Arimathea was a tin merchant. Well, it's kind of hard to prove whether Joseph specifically was a tin merchant, but we do know that those, those trade routes did exist. We have sure uh, confidence, real good confidence that within the first century, the gospel made it to Roman Britain whether it was Joseph of Arimathea, whether, is, whether it was Aristobulus. He is uh, mentioned by Paul in Romans 16. Uh, the Orthodox Church counts him as the apostle to the Britons, to Roman Britain. And it's possible in one of the Welsh records that records the name of the person along with three of his companions who brought the gospel to, to Roman Britain uh, in that particular dialect. When he translated it, it means man of the West. So it's very possible that it is Aristobulus who, who goes to, um, to Britain to carry the gospel at first. There is um, a long history without a whole lot of records, but enough records that lets us know the church is there super early. So for example, uh, one of the records that we have says that the first Bishop of London was around 187, 186 BC. So that's long before the Anglos and the Saxons take, take over. Whether they take over through uh, military conquest or just through, through trade, trade lines, as some historians have deba been debating here in recent history. Uh, nonetheless, when the Roman Empire collapses, the Western Roman Empire collapses because of barbarian invasions, the Roman presence in Britain recedes like a tide. Then you have the incoming uh, barbarians uh, who, who are pagans, no Christian connection, but the church stays there. It never wins over those people that are coming in in any, in a large sense, but the church is still there. So, and we have the church, uh, it's a matter of fact, Ro, uh, St. Patrick, when he is uh, kidnapped by the slave traders, the Irish slave traders, he's a Roman Briton by descent. His, and his father's grandfather is believed to have been a deacon in the church. So there's really, there's a, there's a present, the church is there and Patrick comes from a church family. And so he, but he's not had that personal awakening of conversion to Christ and to own it and to be claimed by him in a, in a direct way. Um, although he's grown up in it or to be about 16 or 17. And it's in slavery that he, he comes to know the, know the Lord personally and powerfully. And then, you know, throughout his life, it goes back then to his, his missionary bishop apostolic work amongst the Irish, but he was a Briton. He wasn't Irish. Might be the patron saint of the Irish, but he, he himself was a Briton, a Roman Briton, who is the result of the gospel in Britain. All of that history is Anglican history. When you get to the end of the 500s AD, Gregory of Great, the Gregory the Great of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, sends some missionaries to England to convert the Anglo-Saxons. So, and, and the, the leader of the, of, the, of the team is Augustine, it's Augustine of Canterbury. There's no Canterbury yet, Augustine actually establishes it. But when he gets there, what he discovers is that it's not unchurched. The church is there, it's just not effectively growing and thriving um, as, as you would want the church to be also discovers, and which they've known about, but uh, the, the, the history here is a, like what, what all they knew was kind of hard to, to, to ascertain. But the Celtic church is still there. It's over the mountain ridge, if you will. And they are having their, the book of the Kells and, and the, the, the ascetic practices, their all night prayer meetings, their staunch fiery uh, meeting uh, services, you know, that, that enthusiasm that's known for the, for the Celtic church. 
And then you've got this smaller, um, I don't want to say weak, but smaller, less effective uh, vestiges of a Roman Britain church that's there when Augustine shows up. Augustine gets permission by the king in Kent, uh, which is on the, the coast there towards the it's in, in interior of the coast to set up uh, a church. And in the span of a few years, Augustine, at the direction of Gregory, had taken all the various liturgies that had existed uh, that he knew about and weaves them in at Gregory's uh, direction into a, a form of service that fits the temperament of the Anglo-Saxons. And the reports come, are coming back that within a handful of years, 10 to 20,000 people are being brought to Christ, baptized, and won into the church. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's a breakdown that the, the Roman Britain and the Celtic churches don't want to work with the Roman model. And the Roman model is so rigid that they're not being very accommodating to the other parties as well. So you end up with like a 60 year decline from all that awesome conversion um, and, and re-paganization starts taking place again. But then in the latter part of the 600s, they're able to come back together and start working through that process with Canterbury being the principal C, the principal at chair of apostolic succession, um, leading the other churches. Then you add York to that and other major um, ma major geographic play, uh, players as the church continues to grow for the next thousand years, seven, 15, 17, 1800 years. So that's why we say Anglican because it's referring to not just Anglo-Saxon, not just English, but what was the Lord doing in that entire historical process there in those aisles, right? When you get to the, to the, the, the colonization, when Europe starts sending out um, you know, voyagers and, and uh, colonizing parts of the world, there's always an English priest of some kind or clergy person who's going out with them to, to be a chaplain, as it were. When the gospel is, starts to be preached in all these other lands where it either had never been or hadn't been in so long that it died out and was being restored, that, that was, though, that's where the development of the Anglican communion comes in. And so where the British Empire went, and maybe you've never heard the phrase, but that used to be said, that the sun never set on the British Empire. It was so massive across the whole world that always at some part of that empire, somewhere the sun was shining. The Anglican church was in all those places. Partly because of chaplains, partly because of an earnest missionary zeal to go preach the gospel to all nations. As the British Empire has receded, the Anglican communion has not so that the, the, the Anglican tradition, the, that English way that was, was uh, Augustine put together and then goes through the reforms with Cranmer and, and, and at the time of Henry VIII and, and, and the settles in 1660. I mean, there's a lot more history here, but all of those different epochal events, if you will, that become to define Anglicanism as part of Christ's whole church spreads all over the world. So the largest province right now of Anglicans, the largest uh, geographic grouping of Anglicans on the planet is in Nigeria. There's 18 million. The Anglicanism as a communion right now is the third largest historic communion. Uh, after Rome and Catholics at, at the top, the Orthodox Church is secondly, and then the Anglican communion thirdly, as far as it goes to just numbers and size. Um, so when we say what is Anglican, it's such a broad scope. And, and I hope that this, this has answered a little bit more about where did it come from. So when we talk, and, and the, the question also asked about the apostolic succession, how does that work linearly? My bishop was a priest, if you've watched those videos on bishops, priests, and deacons, but he, and he was consecrated to be a bishop by the Anglican Church in Uganda. The Anglican Church in Uganda's archbishop so that succession there, if we want to go back linear, like, like dominoes, okay? But remember, it's more of a web, but that's very complicated to explain without massive charts and graphs. So let's talk about it as dominoes, one-to-one, right? -one, linearly. The first bishop 
in what is called Uganda and East Africa, that, that whole part of, of the, the continent there, uh, was a man named James Hannington, who had been consecrated a bishop by the Archbishop of Canterbury, I believe the Bishop of London. I think there may have been a bishop from Ohio, like the United States. There were, there were a number of bishops that were there in Canterbury that, that ordained James Hannington, okay? Hannington dies on mission, in missionary work um, by, by the tribal peoples there. And he tells, supposedly as he's dying, go tell King Mwanga that I've purchased this road with my blood. And so then there's even more missionaries and, and gospel preaching that come in as a result of that. So you go back from my bishop here through Uganda to James Hannington, Hannington back to Canterbury. Canterbury goes back to 596 AD, okay? In that 1300-year window between roughly 596, let's just say 600, okay? 600 to, uh, to, to 1900, all right? In that time frame, when new bishops are consecrated to be the archbishops of Canterbury, there is often the Pope of Rome is involved. Other times there are other bishops from the East, uh, like Tarsus and Jerusalem that are involved. So the whole global connection of who is ordaining who, whom, and how and when they're becoming bishops, all that connection, right? So you can go back to 596, or roughly 600, with the Archbishop of Canterbury, that goes back to Rome, and then Rome goes back to Jerusalem. So there's like how that succession works all through history, okay? So there's, it's, it's um, the expansion of this whole kingdom net and, and succession linearly, but then succession as a net. So I hope that answers the question. I've probably created some more, and it would be good if I had some charts and graphs. But as, as it goes to what is Anglicanism historically, and what does the succession look like? There's a glimpse. Thanks.